This program was made possible in part by Portland State University, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Pacific Northwest Conservation Science Consortium. Also, a grant from the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. And viewers like you, Gnalchish, Haua, thank you. Weaving Chilkat blankets is like merging in this universal consciousness, spiritual area of being human. We talk about the Chilkat dancing blanket as a veil between worlds. Like the closest we can get to the spirit realm without crossing over. It's a practice in meditation and also surrender because I can come to the work thinking I'm going to make a particular shape, I'm going to finesse this particular ovoid and if I'm pushing my will on the work, um, it, I'm going to screw it up. But if I can take my ego and my will out of it and surrender to what this being wants to become, kind of like shaping a human, the work seems to come to life effortlessly. At any given point since the early 1900s, there have been fewer than 12 Chilkat dancing blanket makers in the Northwest Coast. There are many practitioners who have woven a circle or a small apron or smaller like dance leggings or a headdress, but the undertaking of warping up a chill cat dancing blanket is so massive. It's a slow art form with very little gratification checkpoints. A single blanket takes six to eight weeks of preparation, even before twining the first stitch, like putting in the first woven row. Having someone make your loom for you, or harvesting cedar bark, prepping the wool, whether it's mountain goat or merino, spinning the cedar and wool together, washing it, measuring it, hanging it on the loom bars, just to be able to start weaving. You got those um, simmering like 1045? Yes, I did. Okay, so, and we've got the the chocolate lily, and then there's a little marsh marigold. Uh, marsh marigold. I remember when you got that at Kaui yeah. last week. I've been part of this Chilkat dye working group for a couple of years now, meeting once a month, getting together as like kind of a brain trust. All of us throwing ideas, like what were the blues? What were the yellows? Baking soda, but look, this one's with baking soda and that one's with no baking soda. <gasps> My job involves the preservation and the restoration of collections here. So I'm supposed to know what things are made of, how they might deteriorate over time, and how we could keep them for 500 years. Like we want like that. Art and science are things that are sometimes kept separate in our academic structure, in Euro-American learning methods, but they don't tend to be separated in this way in a lot of other cultures. And so conservation as a profession is one of those rare places that art and science are brought together. And in this particular project, the chemistry and the science of what the dyes are made out of brought together with why these dyes are used in these colors and these plants 
by the knowledge and expertise of the weavers is this exciting overlap of these different kinds of expertise. George Emmons, an ethnographer in the 1900s, wrote about the different dyes that we thought were used in our blankets. So over the last couple of years, we've done all this research on, is it true, how these colors came about, with the goal of building a database to dye these different colors. Less, like more purpley than slate silver. Like, I'm Tammy Lasseter Clare. I'm an associate professor of chemistry at Portland State University, and I'm the director of the Pacific Northwest Conservation Science Consortium. The Chilkat Dye Working Group approached Ellen with a request to learn more about the dye stuffs, and so they're interested in connecting to their ancestral uh, weaving community, and a lot of that knowledge um, has either been lost or it's only been partially uh, recorded. And so we're trying to provide them with that knowledge back so that they can make choices about what kind of dyes they use, whether they use the ancestral dyes or whether they choose uh, to use other dyes that might have properties that they, that they prefer. I can run, I haven't analyzed these yet. Okay. Um, so I can run this one minute sample. Yeah. Um, we receive these samples and we begin with non-destructive analysis. So non-destructive analysis is X-ray fluorescence, which is an elemental technique, um, and that tells us about mordants or metals on the fibers. And then we do visual microscopy, which is just taking photos of the fibers underneath the microscope, so we can document the colors and the texture of the fiber and the size of the fibers. It shows that our the, the wool that you used is clean. Right. It's yeah. not contaminated with anything. With any other metals. Right. So Chilkat weaving um, utilizes three main dye colors. Um, so there's a yellow, there's blue-green, and there's brown-black, along with undyed wool. So white is the undyed wool. So we want to identify what all of the colorants are, and that sounds like a simple question, just three colors. Um, in fact, natural dyes were used, synthetic dyes were used, and so in reality, <laughs> the candidates of dye colors um, number in the hundreds. Some of the things the chemists have found with the old robes is that a lot of the blacks are synthetic blacks. They are black yarns that weavers bought, um, you know, even a hundred years ago or more because you could buy black wool yarn through the market. But the yellows and the blues were harder to get. We did so much research finding all the different kinds of flowers, pink flowers, purple flowers, green leaves, like all the things thinking, oh, we're going to get a, you were going to get a vibrant, you were going to get a violet or something and they're yellow, and more yellow. And then if it's not yellow, it's brown. Yellow is an easy color to get. If you were to go and pick a flower out on the landscape right now and smash it up and make a dye bath out of it, doesn't matter what color the blossom is, it's probably gonna make yellow. But the really most interesting thing about the yellows, I think, is a yellow that's very popular for this Chilkat weaving. It's called wolf moss. Wolf moss is actually a lichen, which is not the same um, uh, biological family as mosses, but wolf moss grows out in trees, and you can take this moss and put it in a dye bath, like with water or with urine. It works even better with urine. Get this lovely, warm, golden yellow that the weavers love. But here's the kicker with the wolf moss. It doesn't grow in our rainforest. So they had to trade for it in drier areas that border our rainforest. So in more interior Canada or down into Oregon, and it was a trade item. So why would they trade for something to get a yellow that they could get with substances that they have here? If you start to see it to bubble a little bit. I think the significance in wolf moss is that we can die whenever we want. Once we have it in our possession and it's dry, it is shelf stable for 25 years. We can use it at any point, at any point during the year, at any point next year, um, that we can dye yellow whenever we need it. That's not true for most of the other items in Southeast Alaska that 
you know, if we get horse tails, we have to die with them right then. We've always been really good at sourcing materials that are useful and shelf stable. The uh, blue, green, or turquoise colors that are used in Chilcat robes have been pretty challenging for us and in a research point of view because blue can be a really hard color to make. Folks that know Renaissance painting know that lapis lazuli was this mineral that you ground up and it was super expensive and they only used it for the robe of the Virgin Mary. And for, I mean, for our time immemorial, like blue has been a hard color to make. This is our hypothesized method of getting a blue liquid and we've been using this a long time. From what weavers tell us, one of the ways that is still used is you take a copper pipe and you put it in ammonia and you let it soak. You'll get this kind of boring, steely, grayish color. And this is not a color that I would weave with. But if you dip that in vinegar, so you're changing the pH, you get kind of this nice minty green. Oh my goodness, stirring it around in the vinegar. This is a color that we want to weave with. Interestingly, there's a robe that's on exhibit right now that has that minty seafoam green in the fringe. We used our XRF, our X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, to try to identify that we hoped this was the color, that it was this copper color, right? And it doesn't have any copper in it. So there was some other way they were getting this minty green besides copper. Indigenous peoples, no matter where you go in the world, have always been adapting, right? If climate change is coming, we move our communities inland. If we don't have access to these particular dye materials anymore, and it's easier to get it from the army guys who've come up the coast, we might adapt to that. The weavers, it's, it's thought, maybe extracted indigo from trade cloths. And so these would be maybe blankets from ships that came up and weavers reused that dye to dye their own fibers. And so far, we have found no evidence of indigo, and we've gone through a lot of reality checks to make sure that our instrumentation can detect indigo if it's there, <laughs> and we can say that it, there is no indigo on our samples. We knew that there was a meadow that had a lot of a flower called chocolate lily that we had read might be one of the rare plants that could give us a blue. Worms, yeah. There you go. Oh, this is so beautiful. I've been out here and hiked blue mussel and then taken a little skiff back and we saw an eagle. And it does say if gathered too soon, the bulbs may taste bitter. Mm -hmm. But we're interested not so much in eating it as, as seeing if we can die with it. Right. So there's preparing, dig around the base of the plant and gently pull up the bulb, break bulbs apart to get the kernels, leave a few kernels to replenish. Oh, nice. Um, bulbs can be soaked in water overnight, then boiled for an hour to remove bitterness. Hoping we got some more chocolate lilies. Oh, here we go. And it's a nice mossy area too. Here we go. See, it's coming up. I think I'll take home one plant just to join me at home. You know, when I dye and, or when I weave, I feel like these are things that ancestors have done that I don't even know those ancestors. They were just there at one time and then history happens and takes people along the bends and river and you may or may not connect directly, but through the knowledge getting shared, it makes me realize that that knowledge is there. We just have to be open to it. Yeah, that would be really lovely. One of those old-fashioned drawings where you see the green and the brown of the flower and the green of the leaves and stem. One of the things I think that's important about the colorants is that you could go to Joanne Fabrics or you could go on the internet and you could order yarn in whatever color you want it to be. But that's a little bit detached from the relationships of the place that we're in. If you're going out on the land with your friends and other weavers and you're out in nature and you're looking for this plant and you're hiking and you're you know having a picnic together and you're building relationships with the place that you live there's a wellness component to that and a, a investment in the relationships with the place that you live and with the people that you're with that is powerful <laughs> Thank you.
It's all of these things that involve this whole network of relationships between people and the land and plants and songs and the language and all these things combined together to make that robe. And so the virtuosity to make that robe again isn't the thing that matters. It's that whole network and web of relationships that matters. That. And that whole ongoing network of relationships is something that can come back and be strong and be built and be built in new ways to continue new weavings and new ways of making things and being yeah. creative. As you're weaving, you start having more questions and leaning on each other for answers, you know, looking around and saying, well, how would you do this? And so I think it gives you courage and also encouragement. I've been weaving for about two years. I learned originally from Lily Hope. Lily Hope is uh, um, learned from her mother, but she's a uh, wealth of knowledge for teachers and always encourages us to ask more of the questions we have. She's taught a lot of people to weave, partly because she sees it as an intergenerational, almost responsibility. Once I was in class and being with other people and weaving with other people and watching these patterns come to life, it did become kind of a joy, but I didn't realize that I was building a life of being a weaver until my mother died in December 2016. I was spending time with her, dyeing yarns, spinning warp, prepping cedar bark, harvesting cedar bark. I was doing all the things to be a weaver and yet, at no point did she ever say to me, this is your life work. You understand that you're taking my place. You understand that you're one of my students who will continue the work. It, I learned it from, what's his name? His name is Willie White. He just cuts a strand that's as long as his arm and he just weaves. Cool. That's nice. Yeah, I wouldn't mind putting a dress. At some point, I'd really like to pivot my work toward intentionally welcoming people who are returning to themselves and remembering their culture and their identities. I think the Chilkat weaving particularly holds a lot of that space. Weaving our identities, weaving for our families, is a huge part of the healing. Remembering who we are and why we're here. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Look, 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 look. Oh, look at that one. Sani, you have to sock. Yek not hasati ak kwan. Aya yet yet to hit. Goodness cheese. Goodness cheese. Thank you for being here today. Goodness cheese. I was fortunate a couple of years ago that we had a Clinket culture bearer on staff here at the Alaska State Museum by the name of Liana Wallace. And Liana saw the conservation lab, kind of heard about what we do as conservators, and said, wouldn't it be amazing to have a project that we were exploring dyes and the chemicals and what things are made of, and we were all talking about these together, right? And that was the key thing, was getting someone who's a cultural expert in at the ground level of this research to kind of guide what direction we were going in, what kind of questions were important to the community. Did you already test it? No, we <laughs> didn't. Um, no loose threads underneath. But we could ask permission. Um, Museums do have this long legacy of being takers and um, having bad relationships with indigenous communities and minority communities of all kinds. The scientific community, and STEM in particular, has a history of studying cultural practices, but not actually including people from those areas uh, in their actual research.
unlike George Emmons, where he was in Alaska, he was a naval lieutenant, he observed things, he took photographs, and then he kind of took all that information and went to Chicago or went to the East Coast, where he was from, and spread that information as his own findings. And the Tlingit community wasn't really involved in that. So he presented all these findings at the Natural Field Museum, um, at world expositions, because people were really interested in it. But no representatives from those communities in Alaska were present. For museums, one of the big things that has been a driver in the change in these relationships was something called NAGPRA, the North American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So this federal legislation happened around 1989, 1990, and required museums to give back human remains, grave goods, ceremonial materials to source communities. There was a, a real change in the way museums and communities interfaced with each other. And in some cases, things were just straight up given back to communities. There were um, Chilkat robes that were part of important ceremonies that were returned to the clan that they came from. Uh, particularly in our museum, there were robes that the clan would say, this could come back to our clan, but we don't really have the fire suppression systems, the insurance, the pest control, like all these things that museums do to protect their collections. How about we have this stay in your collection storage under this, you know, in this great building, and if it needs to be on exhibit, sometimes it could be, but then we'll check it out when we need it for our ceremonial purposes. So the Alaska State Museum is innovative you know, on a national and international level in terms of, of this ceremonial use program. There are a few weavers who have absolutely no intention ever to sell their Chilkat blanket work, their Chilkat weavings. They don't want it to be an object for sale because this is our historical documents. This is who we are as a people. Like, how do you sell your history? How do you sell your identity? And that's where I need to be careful in making work that is for museums or art collectors, um, that there are specific designs I will not weave for sale. I'm not gonna weave a clan crest on a blanket unless that clan has commissioned me to do so. The Chilkat Dye Project has been a really interesting research question because you're building relationships with the place that you live. The chemist cannot tell us that. You can't figure that out through a microscope or through laboratory experiments. It's something that's more going to come from what the communities know, what the weavers know, what the cultural practices are. So it's an interesting research conundrum that can, has to be answered by kind of a collaborative method. What I'd love to see with this is the ability to trace the dye stuffs that are used in each individual blanket. 
that at some point we could go to the backside of any blanket throughout time, um, take the tiniest little hairs of the four colors that are used, send it down to Portland State University chemists, and they could send us back a little like, these are the dyes that were used. I bet collectors would love that. I bet museums would love to have that information. I know that I would, just to be able to go to the different museums and say, oh look, these four were actually used with wolf moss, or these ones didn't dye their dark brown with hemlock bark. Look at what it was. And whether we use the natural dyes consistently for the next few hundred years, or if we continue to use acid dyes, I don't know if that's important. But knowing what we did do, and learning from it, and choosing to either go there or not go there again, I like having the option. Because then it rounds out the story. It tells us more about who these people were and where they were and what they had access to. Yeah, it, it really helps bring that story into reality. This program was made possible in part by Portland State University, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Pacific Northwest Conservation Science Consortium. Also, a grant from the Alaska Center for Excellence in Journalism. And viewers like you, Gnachish Hau'a, thank you.